right, I have a thumbs up, which means we are Facebook Live. Um, I'd like to welcome everyone to the um, Mayor and Board of Aldermen meeting of the City of Starkville. This is our recess meeting, which is normally our last meeting for the month of January. We will begin by calling the meeting to order, followed by a Pledge of Allegiance. We'll have a moment of silence, and Alderman Carver will be giving us our invocation this evening. If you would please stand with me. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America. Liberty and justice for all. Alderman Carver, if you would please. Yes, ma'am. Let's pray. Father, we just come before you tonight. We thank you for this opportunity to gather. Lord, we just thank you for this town. Um, we, we pray for blessings over the mayor and the board and the department heads and our employees. Lord, we ask for the safety in this coming year. Uh, we thank you for the blessings that you've already bestowed upon us. Uh, thank you for that, all that you do for us. In your name we pray. Amen. Amen. everyone we appreciate you being here this evening uh, first order of business is uh, approval of the official agenda with consented items and let me from the work session let me let the board know that uh, under utilities department item one um, that was approved for consent based on the excuse me the uh, concurrence of Mr. Huskison and um, Mr. Kemp and they got together and I believe everybody's happy with that agreement so uh, that one will go on consent absent some um, other discussion about it. So um, that particular item, and there is one at the table for, I believe that uh, Alderman Sistrunk notified you of adding the policy, uh, the financial policy. I'll let you go ahead and speak to that if you'd like to. Sure. Um, what we have at the table is an investment policy for the city of Starkville. We have traditionally um, used our depository account, which is an interest-bearing bank account for our um, cash. And we find ourselves in a position of having uh, more cash than usual with the ARPA funds and some bond funds and that sort of thing. And the state does allow us to make certain other types of investments. The, the state has some regulations. The federal government has some regulations. Our bond indentures have some regulations. This policy complies with all of those things and just allows us to um, invest in some other options that provide safety, which is our foremost um, um, objective, um, liquidity of our money so that we can get it when we need it, and um, um, let's see, safety, and, and an increased yield. So we, we're currently receiving about 2.6% um, with that checking account. Um, we think that with the um, options that we have, which are essentially treasury um, issuances, that we can move that up to 4 to 4.25 percent. For our ARPA money, for instance, if we held that money for an entire year, that would be an additional $95,000 that the interest, in interest that would be earned. For our bonds, which we know we're not going to hold for a full year and which have some restrictions in terms of how much we can earn before we hit some arbitrary arbitrage rules, um, we think that we can earn about another 30000 or so for the six or seven months that we will have, have those bond funds before we start actually expending them. So it, um, we, are, we are complying with all federal, state, and local laws. Um, we're, we're using very safe investments, um, nothing in the stock market. It's all going to be government. No crypto. Uh, no crypto. <laughs> we're not investing in bonds of other municipalities. So. Um, the, our only danger is if the U.S. government goes um, bankrupt, but if the U.S. government goes bankrupt, our bank probably has issues too. So those are, those are big things to worry about. But that's what it is, and it just um, delegates the authority for making those investments as opposed to having to bring it back to the board each time we want to make a change in what we're doing. Okay. Is there any uh, concern about putting that one on consent? Any I'm issues? With consent. Okay. question, though, ma'am. That's a question. The money that, that we make off of, say, the ARPA money, will that money go into water and into to, uh, it, utility? Uh, it, it's my understanding that it can be used however we want to use it. So this would be, this could be, it could be general, be, uh, interest be used in, uh, in general funds. It could be used for general fund monies. It could be used for the water sewer project, which we're planning, and that's probably truthfully where it needs I to be say, used be because, the, the yeah, cost and things, yeah, yeah exactly, okay. exactly. Okay, so, with no, with no so, objection, we'll put so, that one. On consent? Okay. All right. Um, then in that case, I need a, a motion for the 
Well, wait a minute. Let's go through this. Mm -hmm. Alderman Carver, do you have any changes to the agenda or consent agenda? No, ma'am. Okay. Alderman Rupp? No, ma'am. Alderman Brooks? No, ma'am. Alderman Baker? Alderman Sisto? No, ma'am. Vice Mayor? No, ma'am. Alderman Ball? No, ma'am, Mayor. All right. Thank you. In that case, I need a motion to approve the official agenda with the consented items as um, amended. So moved. I have a motion from Alderman Rupp. Do I have a second? Second. Uh, I believe I heard Alderman Carver? Yeah. Alderman Brooks? Alderman. Alderman Brooks. All right. Thank you. All right. No discussion. All those in favor, please signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed? Motion carries. It's unanimous. Thank you so much. With that, I will read the um, consented items. We have consideration of the minutes of the January 3rd, 2023 regular meeting of the Mayor and Board of Aldermen of the City of Starkville. We have Community Development and Planning Department consideration of reappointing Richard Harkis and Robert Bruzak to the Landscape Advisory Board to four-year terms ending January 17th through 2027. Under Engineering and Street, we have consideration of accepting the low quote of $136.84 per week from Unifirst Corporation to provide uniforms for street department employees. Two is consideration of accepting the bid from SG Landscaping, Inc. in the amount of 57 for the Cornerstone Boulevard entrance, landscaping project, and authorization for the mayor to execute a construction contract with the low bidder. And I forgot to read out, actually, consideration of approving an investment policy for the city, but since we had done it, I sort of jumped it. But let me go ahead and read that as well. Under Finance Administration, we have acceptance of December 2022 financial statements. Under the Fire Department, we have request permission to allow JMCM Consulting to write and develop FEMA grants for the SFD for fiscal year 24, with the SFD to pay JMCM Consulting 5% of the funded amount for the project administration if the grant is approved. Under HR, we have request authorization to hire China Hornberger as a full-time deputy court clerk in the Municipal Court Department. Two is request authorization to hire Tajur Jones as a non-certified police officer in the Starkville Police Department. Three is request authorization to hire Chris Johnson as a payroll human resources assistant for the human resources and utilities, and utilities department. Four is request authorization to hire Garrett Monroe as an engineering intern part-time in the Starkville Utilities Department. Five is request authorization to hire Samuel Fisher as an aircraft lineman, FBO full-time in the Starkville Airport Department. Six is request authorization to hire Blake Shirley as a grounds maintenance worker for the airport department. Seven is consideration of the discipline recommended by Sanitation Director Chris Smiley as a result of IA number 01042022 for Starkville Sanitation Worker. Under information technology, we have request approval of purchase of 30 kW backup generator for the City Hall Data Center from DOS Electric LLC for $38,695 the lower of two quotes, to be paid with Mississippi Department of Homeland Security grant number A22HS347. Under parks, we have request approval change order number three from Southern Electric Corporations of Mississippi for the repair of broken pipes and wire at Cornerstone in the amount of $15,040. Number two is request approval of purchase of three security cameras for Cornerstone Park at $16,300, the lower of two quotes. Three is consideration to approve the purchase of various cornerstone supplies, furniture, and safety equipment in an amount not to exceed $17,000. Under utilities, we have one request authorization to approve gold service agreement with TK Elevator for the monthly rate of $225. Two is request authorization to accept the lowest quote from Gilliland's tree service in the amount of $7,850 for tree removal in Edgewood. Three. Request authorization to approve the best quote due to delivery time from Improved Construction Methods Company for the emergency purchase <coughs> of a pump for the utilities flush truck in the amount of $7,534.60 as per Mississippi Code Section 31-7-13 sub K and Mississippi Code Section 31-7-1 sub F and that an emergency exists such that the, that the delay in delivery and repairs would be detrimental to the interest of the governing authority and the community. And that concludes the consent agenda items. Thank you, Mayor. It's my pleasure, always. All right, under announcements and comments, the first is uh, Mayor's comments. And so I get to make several today because I've, I've had a, a really good week. We had the Unity Park induction yesterday. We had MLK Day, which we all celebrated. The, the breakfast was excellent. And then in the Unity Park, um, they unveiled two more recipients of the, of the uh, recognition of their contribution to our community. Uh, Ava Moore and Judge Crump were honored, so their plaques are now in the Unity Park area, which was a, an excellent um, uh, event as well. Uh, we've had a couple ribbon cuttings, which I think are fun to talk about. There was a ribbon cutting today at Sport Clips, 
So that is new in town, and I am told that that is something that the men will enjoy. So I say no more. Um, and then we also have a new restaurant opening up. Uh, Blue Dose will be opening on Thursday, and it's a Greek restaurant. So we've added new fare to our offerings, which is uh, uh, great fun. So hopefully everyone will take advantage of all of that. I have introductions to make, which is always fun for me, uh, assuming I can get the names pronounced correctly, which sometimes is a challenge. So we have two Startwell Utilities folks. Mr. Kemp, got your folks with you? All right, excellent. First we have Wes Foreman, who's a GIS locator. And Wes is originally from Jackson, Mississippi, and he now resides in Startwell. Hi, Wes. Hey. Um, he graduated from Mississippi State in 2019, and after graduation he began managing and operating backcountry lodges within national parks in the state of Tennessee until 2022. And You've decided to come out of the backcountry. Yes, ma'am. Well, we're delighted to have you. So thank, thank you, you very much for being with us. Thank you. Happy to be here. And then we have Gary Heitch. Did I get that right, Gary? All right. And uh, Gary's got quite a long, distinguished history, so we're going to read a little bit of this. He's originally from Jasper, Alabama, and currently resides in Caledonia, Mississippi. He graduated from Walker High School in 1986. He attended Bevel State Community College and earned an associate's degree in water and wastewater management while working with Jasper Water Works and Sewer Board. He has worked as a distribution manager, a cross-connection manager, and became a certified grade four water operator. After his time at Jasper, he spent the next 17 years at Limestone County Water. He worked as a chief operator for the first membrane water treatment plant in the southeast, a customer service manager, distribution and collection superintendent, and an interim general manager. Jack of all trades, aren't you? A little bit. Gary retired from Limestone after 27 years of service, and during the last five years, he's worked with Clearwater Solution as a regional manager, handling projects in East Alabama and the Florida Panhandle. And here's the really important part. Gary and his wife, Jessica, have 10 children between them, ranging in age from 4 to 28. And in his spare time, which I can't imagine that you have any, <laughs> enjoy hunting, fishing, and playing golf. And we're delighted to have you. Welcome. Thank you. And next we have two new additions to our police department, and I believe I see them right there in the front row. First we have police officer Joshua Kitchens. Joshua is originally from Kosciuszko, Mississippi. He moved to Starkville in 2010 to finish high school. After high school, he attended Mississippi State University and received his Bachelor of Science degree in 2018. Joshua completed the police academy and started his police career with the Columbus Police Department, bringing three years of experience to the Starkville Police Department, and we are glad to welcome Joshua. Thank you. And then we have Officer Cole, Cole Britt. He was born in Ennis, Texas and raised in Lowndes County, Mississippi. He attended New Hope High School and was an avid athlete. After graduating high school, he enlisted in the United States Marine Corps and attended basic recruit training in Paris Island, South Carolina. He enlisted as an infantry rifleman and assigned to 1st Battalion, 2nd Marine Division, Charlie Company, 2nd Platoon. He was deployed as part of the Global Response Force to the Mediterranean Sea as a part of Marine Air Ground Task Force in 2011. He deployed twice during Operation Enduring Freedom, departing active duty as a non-commissioner officer. Thank you for your service. After completion of his military service, he became a sworn law enforcement officer, graduating from Mississippi Law Enforcement Officer Training Academy in Pearl. The past seven years, he served in the capacity of a law enforcement officer through multiple roles as a criminal investigator, alert instructor, dual purpose canine handler, SWAT operator, narcotics agent, and field training officer. Cole is honored to be a part of the Startwell Police Department and looks forward to aiding his fellow officers and being a positive influence within the community. And we are delighted to have you. So. Thank you both. All right, and one last but absolutely not least, I had the opportunity at uh, Mr. Kemp's request, which I think was a wonderful request, uh, he has asked that we recognize the folks who worked so hard under such terrible circumstances over the uh, frigid temperatures that we have. So I have a proclamation that I'm going to read, and then I'm going to let Mr. Kemp present it to them. I'm going to have to read one of them. So I'm going to stand up here and read it to you gentlemen. Proclamation by the Mayor and Board of Aldermen of the City of Starkville commending Starkville Utilities Water Division employees during Winter Storm Elliott. I didn't know the storm had a name. Whereas the city of Starkville and the entire southeast region experienced severe weather during winter storm Elliott, including temperatures in the single digits with negative wind chills, 
And whereas this winter weather impacted all residents of Starkville by freezing pipes, breaking mains, and disruption of water service, and whereas Starkville Utilities Water Division employees Charles Jordan, Kevin Ware, DJ Robinson, and Ronald Evans responded to over 150 water service calls in the time period between December the 23rd, 26, 2022, and whereas these individuals responded to each of these calls without hesitation at all hours of the day and night to assist residents in their time of need. Now, therefore, as mayor of the city of Starville, I, D. Lynn Spruill, do hereby recognize on behalf of the Board of Aldermen each of those individuals and offer our sincere appreciation for going above and beyond to serve our community, placing that above their own self-interest. In witness whereof, I have hereunto set my hand and caused the seal of the city of Starville to be affixed on this 16th day of January, 2023. So, would you forgive these folks? particularly unpleasant time from police and fire to sanitation and the uh, electric department. Uh, it, it was uh, nobody's favorite few days here in Starkville, but, but we, we uh, got through it and it's thanks in great part to the terrific employees that the city of Starkville has. Thank you. Mayor. Mayor, very briefly, I rarely get uh, seek recognition, uh, but First of all, I want to say I want to join in and concur with the Honorable Budget Chair on recognizing all our city employees for all their excellent work, including Mayor, the, um, the staff that you just recognized from the Utilities Department. And secondly, I want to recognize, I always want to recognize my colleagues. I see the distinguished gentleman from Ward 5, who used to be Ward 5, now is in Ward 6, the gentleman from, uh, who's now our uh, chairperson of our Planning and Zoning Commission, uh, served with distinction and honor during the 2009 to 13 term 
And finally, Mayor, I want to thank uh, our honorable budget chair for her excellent leadership and her field of expertise in bringing that very excellent investment policy. It, it has um, enormous value to our overall best interest. So, honorable budget chair, you're to be commended. And this is a matter that I always like to uh, consider and vote on. So, thank you for your leadership. I yield, Mayor. Thank you. Well said about all of employees. They really, really do a great job. Thank you. <clears throat> all right. That concludes the announcements and comments from the board. We now go into citizens' comments, which uh, allows anyone to come up and provide us um, three minutes of opinions, uh, thoughts, concerns. So um, that will be timed by our city clerk, Ms. Harden. And so if you would, please, when you come up, uh, we'd like to have... I'd like to have your name? Um, Mr. Turner. Good evening to the mayor, my name is Ward 7. Um, to the mayor, to the police, to the um, sanitation, to, to the fire chief. Um, we want to thank uh, the city of Star for, uh, for opening up the safe room during the fifty weather and thank for that no one uh, was out in the cold and froze. We, we thank the city for that. We, and we, we also um, want to thank everyone for the MLK uh, celebrating that we did on yesterday. Uh, it was good to uh, uh, come back together after two years of being apart. Uh, also, uh, citizen concern about uh, the uh, uh, inspection of rental properties uh, after the situation that we had with uh, the properties on on the west side. Our, uh, and also. Um, my, my, my sister and I, uh, uh, our, our baby brother been gone six years, but we, uh, when the police speaks about homicide, we kind of don't know what that means. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Turner. Hello, everybody. My name is Emma Van Epps, um, and I would like to express my thoughts on the agenda topic of reinstating curbside recycling services. Um, so, of course, curbside recycling, recycling is a foundational part of creating a more sustainable community. Um, it conserves energy, <coughs> reduces air and water pollution, reduces greenhouse gas, emis gas emissions, conserves natural resources, and is one of the most one of the most effective strategies in keeping items out of the landfill. Um, and I know that Starkville has previously stated that they'd like to eventually reinstate curbside recycling services. Um, I have a quote from cityofstarkville.org that re reintroducing residential recycling services is part of the city's long range commitment to create more opportunities to reduce Starkville's carbon footprint through multiple sustainability programs. And so I would like to express my interest in continuing these sustainability programs and the reintroducing of these curbside recycling services. Um, and the website goes on to state um, that, in it, that curbside recycling is an investment in the future that will help protect the environment for our children and our grandchildren. Um, and so I do urge you to consider the long-term impact of Starkville's environmental policies. Um, if you enjoy fishing and hunting and spending any time outdoors with children or grandchildren, and then why would we deny them uh, the opportunity and not take the steps that we can take right now um, to preserve the beautiful natural resources that we have outside of Starkville that we also advertise so heavily to potential visitors and re future residents. Um, but also, residents have expressed interest in curbside recycling. Um, according to data, that, to data that we've collected from over 300 Starkville residents, 92.6 of respondents have re said that they are willing to pay $6 a month to reinstate curbside recycling services. Um, and 86% were also willing to pay an additional fee um, for buying their own bin. Um, and we know that curbside recycling serviced about 1,200 participants before it shut down. And so we are confident that, based on the aforementioned data, that there is strong enough community interest to reinstate curbside recycling services and that it would meet and or exceed 
previous levels of participation. Um, but it also benefits not just the environment, but marketing for the city of Starkville. People want to live in greener communities. Um, according to Forbes and a Southern Cross University multi-generational study, 77% of people want to learn how to live more sustainably. And of course, these rising trends in environmental concern have resounding impacts on where people choose to live and work. One minute. Thank you. According to a 2022 study by Data Management, um, company called Era, a lack of action on environmental and social impact contributes to brain drain, which is the loss of human capital from one area to another. Um, and that's something that Mississippi is seeing significantly with as many as 50% of college uh, graduates from Mississippi universities moving out of state to pursue their careers. Um, and people also want to retire in greener communities. Um, as a certified welcome home re retirement community, I think it's incredibly important that we also meet the interest of potential retirees. Um, actually, the New York Times says that supply for retirement sustainable retirement community is not keeping up with the demand. And I believe Mayor Sproul yourself said that the importance of the retirement community in our city cannot be overstated, which I of course agree with. Um, even Starkville.org's Seven Reasons to Retire in Starkville advertises its surrounding natural beauty and great ecotourism opportunities. And that's, that's your three minutes. thank you very much. Yes, thank you. Hi, I'm Rebecca Carruth, and I also want to talk on Rebecca Carruth. 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 I also want to talk on the curbside recycling point in the agenda. The Think, the Think Green Center is more difficult for residents with decreased mobility to haul their recycling to, which could be a concern for retirees, which is why curbside recycling is such an important thing to reinstate. Um, I also recycling is a bipartisan issue. This past March, Government Tate Reeves introduced House Bill 1135, which supports advanced recycling technology, growth, and regulation. The Mississippi Manufacturers Association described recycling as a priority issue that creates a path for innovation, innovative technologies to locate in Mississippi. The MMA continued on to state that achieving the goal of increased recycling, helping to build a more sustainable economy, all while promoting investment in our state, is something to strive for that will benefit all Mississippians. Um, I also would like to state I am a Starkville resident and native. I was born here and raised here, and I now go to Mississippi State University. And I remember when curbside recycling was available, and when it was taken away during the COVID pandemic, um, we, my family experienced a significant increase in the waste that we were throwing away and sending to a landfill. And as a college resident, the majority of what I throw away and my waste is recyclable. And I personally feel as if I'm not doing enough because I don't have the opportunities to do enough through, for sustainability in my community because I, don't have access to um, going to the Think Green Center um, as I do not have a car, I take the buses. And um, so curbside recycling would give me access to being able to recycle, which is really important to me. I'm also a Christian, as I know many of you are, and I work with a local church, Trinity Presbyterian, as a youth group leader. And a pillar of my faith is that as a Christian, um, I am a steward of the environment and so recycling obviously is super important for being sustainable and keeping our planet clean and healthy and um, so through my faith i that's something that's really really important to me thank you thank you hello uh, my name is grant peterson i am a starkville native and i also go to mississippi state i'm a wildlife and fisheries major um, and I just want to also give my support for curbside recycling. Uh, as someone who's from Starkville and has divorced parents, I've seen like two different households deal with recycling um, since I've grown up and also uh, since the curbside recycling program was discontinued. Uh, my mom is very environmentally conscious, so she takes that extra effort to take her recycling to the Think Green Center, and I really commend her for that. Um, my dad and stepmom, they also like support the environment, but they don't necessarily have the time or like the commitment to take that extra step and bring their curbside recycling. And as Beck mentioned, I've also seen just how much more waste we throw away. Um, and I know there are a lot of families in Starkville who like recycled when we had the curbside recycling program, but now have stopped and they don't want to take their curbside recycling to the Think Green Center but having the opportunity to have the city do a good service for them and allow them to 
easily recycle, they would start again and start recycling, and I think the momentum would build from there. Um, and I think it's part of the government's job to not only allow citizens to be good, I'm sorry, let me, let me, uh, I think it's part of the government's job to allow citizens to be better citizens, be good neighbors, and also be better stewards of, stewards of the earth. I think the government can do a great job supporting our citizens and giving them this opportunity to do good by the earth, by do good by our natural resources and preserve our natural resources for future generations. Uh, so I hope you consider these and consider the recycling program and bring it back. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Peterson. Hi, my name is Tanner Jones. I'm also a Mississippi State student. I am not a Starkville native. I'm from Murfreesboro, Tennessee. And growing up, I actually lived pretty close to a landfill. And growing up there for 18 years, I can tell you that landfill grew pretty fast with the amount of population we had there. And it's not fun, it's large, it smells, and it overlooks the city. Now, when we throw away a lot of recyclables, our landfill grow faster and faster, and we start running out of room to put our waste. Now, not only are we actually wasting recyclables that we can use to build other products, that's also, we're also taking up more land that can be valuable for other things. And I think it's really important that we give our citizens the opportunity to go and recycle and not only protect our landfills and keep those to the minimum, but also to give us the opportunity to create new products out of things that we can. Um, and I think that would be a wonderful opportunity to have. I live in the uh, carpet complex, this hangout, which is called now. And like Rebecca had said, a lot of my waste is recyclables just because it's difficult for me to get things to the recycling center or to campus. And I'd feel so much better just having a recycling dumpster at my apartment complex. And I think a lot of students would just throw it away, ex or uh, recycle those, especially with the amount of stuff we order from online. Everything comes in a cardboard box. Everything's wrapped in plastic. These are things we can easily recycle. And with all those shipments coming in constantly, it'd be really nice if we could put those to good use. So thank you. Thank you, Mr. Jones. Hi, my name is Courtney Cochran, and I'd first like to thank the board for considering this issue today. I really appreciate that y'all are also listening to us and hearing us out. Um, I appreciate it a lot. So you'll notice in the packet that we provided that um, kind of in the back half of it, there's a lot of information on how different SEC towns um, have kind of bottled their curbside recycling programs and tried to make them feasible, because I understand that that was a concern with reinstating it, and that's completely understandable. And I would just like to iterate that um, we would like to do anything we can to help y'all if this is like in figuring out how to make this a feasible um, issue, like make this feasible for the city. Um, it's kind of like the JFK quote, ask not what you can, what your country can do for you, like ask what you can do for your country. And we are ready and willing to do whatever we can to help. And we even provided a little graphic at the back of the um, like packet to show um, kind of some of the things we could do to help. Um, so yeah, thank you so much for your time, and again, I really appreciate your consideration. Thank you, Ms. Copper. Hello, my name is Lynn Peterson. Um, I live in the Green Oaks neighborhood. Uh, as my son mentioned, I am an avid recycler, and I'm dedicated enough that I do take my recycling um, uh, to the city. A spot, but I will say that is very inconvenient. And my daughter now jokes that our car is a rolling recycling bin because I've got <laughs> so much stuff in there that I'm always looking for. The, the hours are not very convenient for me, so I'm always like hoping I'll have a minute to run by there and drop things off. And I'm often frustrated because when I get there, the bins are so full that I can't even fit my things in there. And that tells me that there really is a lot of dedication and interest that people want to recycle, that the bins are so full that we can't fit our things in. Um, and then the third point I want to make is that I really feel that we owe it to our young people to provide leadership on this issue. I mean, look at the turnout. Look at all the young people that are here who care about this issue. And um, we should be leading the way, um, but it's actually our young people that, and they're the ones who are going to inherit um, this planet, and we need to um, do everything we can to leave it in the best shape that we can for them. So I hope you all will vote to reinstate the curbside recycling. Thank you. My name is Doug Feig. I'm, a, I'm not a young person. I'm an old person. I lived in Starkville since 1979. I'm here to speak in support of reestablishing the 
curbside recycling. We took part in that you know, in place before, and I remember being kind of amazed at how quickly I filled up those green bags far more quickly than I filled up the black bags with my garbage. Uh, since the termination of curbside, I hadn't participated in carting my stuff up uh, to the north side of town. And like Lynn Peterson noticed, <laughs> oftentimes the bins were full and I had to jam things in there. And uh, in any case, uh, uh, and it also was very disheartening since the termination of curbside recycling to have all these plastic things that ended up going into the garbage when they should have gone into recycling had that been available. So I hope that will be established, perfectly willing to pay the six bucks a month for whatever it does take to finance the program. Thank you. Thank you, sir. All right, anyone else? Your citizen's comments? Anyone else? All right, seeing none, I will close it for citizen's comments, and we will move into the agenda, which is we have the pleasure of uh, hearing from, as uh, the Vice Mayor said, a former alderman and current chair of the Planning and Zoning Commission, uh, Jeremiah Dumas. And he is joined by Ronnie White of Mississippi State University Transportation Department, and they are going to meet their requirements, but they're going to give us a, a show about the smart transportation system. Another Thank you. Okay. Appreciate the comments. Uh, I thought I was a good alderman, but you need to live in Roy Perkins' uh, ward to know how well he's represented. So that's uh, Thank you, Jim. Thank you. Learning well. Okay. All right. So this is uh, an annual requirement. We're here every year with y'all to talk about smart. As part of our proposal process with the Mississippi Department of Transportation, uh, it does require a notice of our intent to apply for federal funds as well as a notice of this public hearing. So we do appreciate opening it up for uh, comments obviously from y'all or questions y'all may have and then also for the, anyone in the audience that would like to, uh, to uh, make a comment or ask a question. So quick update, y'all see this every year of what we are, but it is a requirement to talk these things through with you. Um, we do operate under 5311 rural mass transit funds. These, uh, we are a sub-recipient as being a rural community of the Mississippi Department of Transportation and these are Federal Transit Administration funds. Our funding model is uh, on the administrative and capital cost side, that's an 80-20 match. So we receive 80% of our funds from the FTA. On the operational side of things, we receive 50% of our funds and required to have a 50% cost share uh, for operations. We operate two different types of routes. We operate fixed routes, which are the bigger buses and the cutaway buses you see going around the community on a fixed schedule, on a fixed route with fixed stops. And then we operate a paratransit program that is on demand. So that's a 24-hour call notice and application process for those that qualify through uh, their uh, a handicap process of door-to-door of -door service that is really growing and a uh, source of pride for us. And then. By way of MDOT, we are required to participate in regional and statewide coordination, which we do. So to talk a little bit about the calendar year 22, uh, we did see a 25% increase in ridership this year, and these are on our fixed route, or these numbers are fixed route numbers. Um, I will say, though, that even with that increase, you may remember from last year, COVID hit public transit across the nation hard. Uh, very low numbers, significant drops in fare box revenue, significant ridership number losses. And so even with the 25% uh, increase that we saw this past year, we're still 42% below where we were pre-COVID. Um, what is good though is from a city standpoint, and I always talk to you about how we love to move students and we, we had our growth and birth out of a on-campus transit system. Uh, apart from paratransit, we're very proud of the numbers that we see growing in the community. Um, and you know, establishing a rural fixed route system is something that we knew to be a challenge. But this past year, when you looked at our average monthly ridership and you average that across our system, 50% of our ridership over the past year was on city routes. Uh, and just as a, as a way of comparison, 32% was our lowest city average. So last February was the month in which we saw our lowest percentage of city ridership and it was still at 32%. Whereas three or four years ago, we were good to get 20% of our overall ridership for a month on city routes. Um, so we're glad to see that our city participation is growing. You can't see this, but I show it to you every year about the numbers, uh, monthly numbers. Obviously, we, um, we have significant peaks and valleys associated with on-campus uh, populations with student densities on campus with our large volumes of ridership that we have. This past year, a point of pride of ours is that we saw our five millionth rider. Um, 
on our city routes, we've had about 1.5 million riders on city routes alone, and that's since January of 2014. Um, and so obviously a large point, uh, you know, the, the other numbers, 3.5 million are obviously on campus riderships, but, but even still, we still see significant changes and fluctuations of ridership based on um, semesters and, and when school starts. Our paratransit, even with COVID, uh, this past year, we're proud to say that we're actually higher than we were pre-COVID with paratransit numbers. Uh, it's something that we've seen continue to grow. Uh, you may remember we've talked about this in the past where Octibaugh County was, was part of a, a larger uh, series of counties that was highlighted by the Mississippi Department of Transportation of really being void of any transportation. And most notably, they were concerned about the fact that there was no transportation for those in wheelchairs, for those handicapped, et cetera. And so they've worked closely with us to establish our paratransit program that we're very proud of and continue to see it grow and to even get back to where it was pre-COVID. So quick accomplishments, uh, proud of those pre-COVID numbers. We're proud of our continued growth on our fixed route riderships. Um, we're proud of the fact that our city routes continue to see an increase in the percentage of our overall routes. Phase two of our driver pay raise was implemented this past year and it was a um, it was a length of service pay raise that we implemented through our HR department where uh, phase one was implemented in the prior calendar year. This past year, we were able to bump that into phase two. This past summer, and I'll talk briefly about this in just a second, we uh, implemented the largest system-wide modification we've had since our beginning. And it was based on some things we were hearing with riders, some improvements we knew that we needed to make to help efficiency but better connect uh, riders. And then we're very proud to have moved into our operational facility that I know some of y'all attended the ribbon cutting of. And um, this again was a funded project through FTA. We received 80% of the funds for this. And it's been, a, um, it's been a significant change for us where when 2014 we were operating out of a double ride trailer. Uh, and now here we are working in, in a world-class facility that, that MDOT's proud of, FTA's proud of. And in fact, we're hosting uh, tomorrow, the statewide FTA drug and alcohol training program in our in our new facility. So, proud program or a proud facility that that we see really indicates or is indicative of the level of service that we provide on campus. Uh, as y'all know, the cost of poker has gone up across the table uh, with all things that are happening. So our budget continues to increase as well. Don't look at me. I'm looking directly at the budget <laughs> chair. Uh, and so, uh, you know, we've grown from two or three million dollars a year now to where we're, our, our proposed budget is a little over six million. Uh, back to those cost share models, the big part of this is the fact that that, that has a requirement of a little over 2.5 million in local match. Um, we're very thankful this year that we went from $50,000 to $75,000 as one of y'all's uh, outside contribution uh, <coughs> recipients and we hope to continue to, to um, do what is needed for those conversations to continue so that we get in line with, with some of our other <coughs> peer institutions and cities to handle their, their mass transit. But we're very proud of the 75 that we get. Uh, and then we do have some various contracts and advertising revenue that's there, but uh, as always, the lion's share, a little over 2.2 million will come directly from MSU. You can't see this, um, <coughs> but just to, to give you a little idea of how we change things this year, um, We've learned through the years that people want to get to campus and they want to get to the Super Walmart. Uh, <laughs> at one time, and with, uh, with Alvin as, as one of our most faithful, and, and he's, he accounts for uh, several of those five million rides, um, we knew they wanted to go to Vowels too. And Vowels was a good hub for us because it was centrally located, it helped things, things work, and obviously it's going through a transformation as we speak. But um, one thing as part of our management team discussed last year is that we needed to find ways to, to not terminate routes short of Walmart, but to get people to Walmart. And so for example, the Starville South route that used to go to the Sportsplex, it went to the Medicaid office and then it went back campus bound, that route now extends to Walmart. So those living along Lynn Lane would have had to transfer on two different buses to get to Walmart. Uh, the same is true for the Boardtown North, which goes what's now the Starville North. Uh, that route used to go from Walmart to Walmart, but we also had riders that wanted to go to campus, so we've changed that. Uh, the Starville Central route used to go through the Avenue of Patriots, turn around and go back, but now that route, anyone on University and Main Street can now uh, go all the way to Walmart. Um, and so Walmart's a significant hub of ours and, um, and a big part of, of the ridership of those on a daily basis that want to get to and from their groceries. Uh, 
Thankfully, Triangle Crossing, the new development on Industrial Park and Highway 12 is now a stop for us. Uh, so we're already seeing the fruits of some of those planning efforts take place to better connect people across the community. Um, one of our goals for the next year is to explore options along Blackjack. So you'll see that in the yellow. I assume that's yellow. The one on the right that goes down Blackjack. Uh, I don't know if any of you have been out Blackjack recently, but um, there's been significant development in the last 10 years. But just as we speak today, there's 600 new beds being built on the corner of Wingo Way and Blackjack. It's just a continual effort there. And all those people try to walk or try to bike or try to park on campus. And so when you look at the, the, the metrics of who it is we want to serve, that's a population we want to serve. But um, until about two years ago, we didn't want a bus on Blackjack. It was uh, in very poor shape. Uh, thankfully, now with some infrastructure changes, we're able to explore that. Uh, and so that is our primary goal for this year, looking operationally and looking at our service area and how we can explore Blackjack. But that comes with two real caveats. One is staffing. Um, despite two phases of pay raises, um, someone with a CDL and passenger endorsements is a highly sought after commodity. Um, very competitive market from the commercial driving standpoint. So we're doing everything we can to be competitive from the hiring perspective so that we can be fully staffed because we've not been fully staffed in what, a year and a half, two years? Um, so that obviously has impacts on service. And then not only that, but y'all know what it's like to procure things. Uh, we're 18, 24, and even longer months out from buses we've ordered to being delivered. Uh, so we're now having to rethink everything we do from a purchasing standpoint to even bring some of that in-house, which has traditionally been with MDOT, to build our own purchasing agreement so that we can have that under our control to get buses that are significantly delayed across the market. Because we started in 12, well, we bought our first buses in 12 and 13, so a lot of the buses you see on the, the road today are 10 years old. And traditionally, an end of useful life uh, scenario with most buses or that 10 or that 10 year scenario so thankfully we have a very good maintenance staff uh, I won't name names but there is a sister organization in the state that um, is really struggling with with buses and service levels because they just can't maintain the buses they have and they can't get them so those are our two biggest issues that we're really trying to work through this year to uh, to be at a point where we can continue the service that we have I miss anything, Ronnie? Yes, sir. Anything you want to add? Okay. Um, Thank y'all. Any questions of the board of Mr. Davis? Maybe just a comment. I mean, I was I explored Blackjack the other day, and I don't know what came first, the, the reconstruction of the road or the student housing. That's an explosion of growth out there, and that yeah. road was in, uh, the worst road I've ever ridden on. And then to turn it around and make it the best road around. Uh, Try definitely. Bardwell and Old Mayhew now. Oh, man, it's incredible. Yeah, it is. I yield. Um, and I wanted to ask a question while I've got you. Would you give a brief update on the timeline associated with the TAP grant, College View TAP grant? Yes. Um, so if you've been by College View, so, so the corner of 12 and 182, so between College View Apartments and Highway 12, um, that's a, a joint project between us and y'all of MDOT funds to build a multi-use path like we've done multiple times over the last several years to connect College View uh, Drive through the woods and creek along to your build project on 182 and Old West Point Road. And so they are finishing dirt work. Um, we're expected an opening in March. So this everything's year? moving pretty quick of this year. Uh, we met last week. The longest lead time at this point is a metal construction, a prefabricated bridge to go over the creek. Um, but they're expecting delivery of that sometime in March. And that will be the last. It'll be a plug and play at that point, hopefully, to move pretty quickly. Well, thank you. I just knew that I, I was hoping that we would have a kind of a timeline we could we could work with. And where, where would be the best place to, to get? Where would be the best I'm place sorry, to get on, on that? On the car? I'm sorry. Where would be the best place to get on that? Like, a, well, 182 so the, or a college? Yeah, 182. Meeting. So it'll leave. Um, so Edward and I obviously have worked several years together on several things, and y'all have championed a lot of this of connecting multiple points into campus. The last frontier was that kind of northwest quadrant at College View. Um, and so the sidewalk itself leaves the existing sidewalk and multi-use path just east of the Child Development Center. So where the Child Development Center is mm -hmm. next to the apartments. So it goes through the woods, along the creek, crosses the creek, and then it goes out on 182 just east of Herbert Street. The grandma's house. Uh, yeah. And then it goes along 182 across the railroad bridge, and then it will tie in. It's designed to tie into the, uh, the build project at 
Oh, West Point Road. So you should have a multi-use path all the way along 182 that links directly into campus at that point. So thank you. Yeah, sure. No, it's it's a cool project, and I know you've got other work to do because we need to do a public hearing. But I just wanted to capture you while I had a chance. So. Glad to do it. Okay. Do you want to open it as a public hearing? Any other comments, questions? I, do, I have just a couple. Oh, I'm sorry, Alvin Brooks. Yes. I, I saw in the in the paper some legals where you were advertising. And are you looking at doing this para, para uh, use plan off like countywide or something? No, we just have to do that as a notice of intent to apply okay. for funds. So it just has to say our service area is Octavia County. And then since we go to GTR in the airport, so we, we do an arrival departure, every arrival departure, we also have to say that we have Lowndes County as a service area. Okay. They get a little finicky on service area. Okay. But yes, we'd love to go in the county. We did for a year and then they, they, they did not fund our service, but it was a highly sought after service in the county uh, for the same reasons it is in the city of Starville. Yeah, I knew that you were, and I, I wasn't really aware. Maybe I was aware of it, but I lost the point. But I, if you, that's what you were trying to do, is seek other funding. No, sir. Uh, on buses, I, I, I've noticed that, uh, that uh, there's been a big push for electric school buses around. Have you, have you guys looked at any of those? We have. Um, we actually went and toured a bus facility to look at it. With um, We know that the, the frontier of diesel Sold solely diesel motors is somewhere out there. We don't know where it is, but we know we're approaching it. So we've looked at electric. Uh, hybrid buses are a big part of the, the equation, and then uh, hydrogen buses are another part. And so the big issue now is range of buses. Current range of a big heavy-duty bus like we have is about 250 miles. That, will ha that, that would do okay around campus, but a lot of the quick charging stuff is just not there for those big of a motors. Um, are big of those, that big of a battery. Um, we think the best fit for us is a hybrid because it can actually char recharge itself while it's in route. Okay. But, but you're looking at a bus, I mean, just to give an example, where Ronnie's been working on our budget, the, the big buses we now currently are running cost us about $375,000 two years ago, the last time we received them. This year, those same buses are $500,000, and that's just a diesel burning bus. If you get to an electric bus, you're looking at about six hundred fifty, seven hundred thousand dollars plus. It's cost about a hundred thousand dollars to put the infrastructure to charge it, because you don't go just put a a one ten on the wall and plug into it. Um, when you get into a hybrid or hydrogen, you're talking about a million plus just for a vehicle. Um, and the equation for seventy five thousand dollars, we'd be glad to look at electric on that uh, outside contribution, just whatever that comes up to be. We feel your pain. Yes. <laughs> There's <coughs> one other thing, uh, the, the vials, uh, we're, uh, I know that they're getting closer on the site plan with that. You, you moved, obviously you moved because they closed that. Where, where did you relocate that to? Louisville Street. Okay. Uh, and so it's, it's just south of the railroad track, and we've still got some infrastructure to work on in that. But that was kind of the, Lynn and I looked at, we, everybody looked at it to try to find a way to get on Wood Street. Those buses just can't make that turn. Um, Turning into Woods easy, coming out of Woods is even more difficult at times with traffic. But um, we did hate to lose that. We've talked to we've talked to the developer about it, and we hope through time we can continue to have that because you take the Con Acres, and there's several people in there that were valued riders of ours that really don't have any other option. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. All right. Anyone else? I'm sorry. All involved? Oh, okay. All right. Well, let's open it as a public hearing. Okay. So anyone wishing to speak to this matter uh, about the smart bus? Mr. Mr. Turner, I hope you would. Absolutely. As a, as a devout user. Would you That's right. I uh, agree with you. My name is Al Turner. And uh, we are thankful for everything we uh, we let we uh, we have a lot of uh, drivers that don't live in Starbucks and they depend on me to try to help them. Uh, we have a lot of young ladies um, when 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 they go ten one hundred or uh, that bathroom or uh, we need to have a safe place for them because we got everything going on uh, and. Uh, they are getting used to, uh, but uh, when they're not from here, 
uh, they want to have someone to help them. And so uh, we need to, uh, if they uh, have to go 10 100 or a female, or uh, they need a safe place that they can go. Also, um, they are uh, children are wondering uh, about the new shopping center where they put a bus stop there as well. And uh, one more thing is um, our after hours, if we, if we have a problem, we let them, we be wondering who can we contact if we have a problem after hours. And uh, that just concerns uh, uh, me and the drivers and Thank you, Mr. Turner. <coughs> yes, ma'am. Hello. My name is Linda Jones. Linda Jones, thank you. I'm here with my daughter, uh, Janiah Jones. She's part of your mayor's youth council. And I'm glad we came because I do have a question. I'm not sure if this is the correct place to ask it, but I do have a question for you as far as the route that the bus uh, takes. I'm very thankful for Mississippi State working with the city of Starkville getting this started up, but I'm concerned in about East Mississippi Community College. I know you guys go out to the airport and have a route going out there, and in doing that route, you are passing East Mississippi Community College, which is growing itself, the Mayhew campus. Um, I'm asking about that because I have two young children who will be going to the community college before they go to Mississippi State University. And I'm just concerned as to whether or not there'll be a route there to help them out with that transition. Or I can do it, and I can put it on myself to do it, but it would be a great help if there was a route to do that. Thank you, Ms. Jones. Okay. Yeah. Yes, you may. So we have tried for years to establish a route in the um, the, the airport bus is set on a very strict schedule because those people are departing and want to get there. All right. Correct. So Anyone else wishing to speak either for or against? Public hearing. Seeing none, I'll close it as a public hearing. Anything further that you need from us? All right. Any other questions of Alderman Dumas? Former Alderman Dumas, I'm sorry. Smart Transportation Head Alderman Dumas. Uh, before we let him go. All right. Thank you so much. And thank you for what you do. We, we are greatly appreciative of the asset. All right. Uh, next item, we do have a public hearing for amending the utilities of the municipal code. Mr. Kemp, are you going to manage that for us? Good evening, Mayor, Vice Mayor, uh, Board. Uh, I don't have a presentation, uh, and, and I'll be happy to answer any questions that might uh, the board might have, but. In, in essence, what the uh, code is revising to, uh, making two changes to the current utility code, uh, just for immediate uh, needs, and with a with a more comprehensive uh, revision occurring later this year. <coughs> the first is uh, outlining more enforcement on the fire hydrant tampering, with the goal of trying to reduce the amount of brown water uh, that is seen around town. Uh, we feel like that there is some cases where private contractors are coming in using uh, city hydrants without our knowledge um, and utilizing those to fill water tanks and that type of thing. So trying to enforce that portion of the code. Um, if, the, if the board approves this, obviously we will start a communication campaign initially 
to try to educate our, our contractors on, on why this is important and what the ramifications will be. And then we're also working on uh, constructing a, a uh, filling station or operation center where contractors can come and fill up their water tanks at a very nominal charge, but we're able to control it a little bit better. And we know um, how to operate those valves in a way that doesn't disrupt all the, the lines. The second portion is um, addressing uh, a previous section in the code that dealt with our sewer only customers. We have some pockets around town where we have sewer only customers, for, uh, specifically up north in Rock Hill community where there are Rock Hill Water Association, four county power, but we are provided uh, sewer service through a CDBG grant that's been approved in the past. Uh, our current code requires us to have an agreement with a third party uh, that reads water meters <clears throat> and that water meter usage is then translated into a sewer um, bill. Uh, we've been utilizing uh, Golden Triangle Planning and Development District for the last several years and have not had a lot of success on uh, really enforcement of those bills that haven't been paid. With the board approving a flat rate of a flat sewer rate for sanitation only customers, we are there, thereby taking out the third party and the, this new code provision eliminates the need or the requirement to have that third party read and bill for startable utilities. It will also allow us to install a secondary cutoff behind the customer's water meter to turn the water service off if they do fail to pay their sewer bill. So those are the two global uh, changes. Again, I'd be happy to answer any questions uh, that the board might have. Okay. Anyone have any questions before I open it to the public hearing? Okay, seeing none. I'll open it as a public hearing. Anyone wishing to speak uh, either for or against this item or about this item, now would be the time to do so. Anyone? Seeing none, I will close it as a public hearing. We will have a second public hearing at the next board meeting, which then it would be the opportunity for us to consider the item. So, anything further from this? All right. Thank you. So we move to board business, and the first thing under board business, actually the remaining only thing under board business, is discussion and consideration of the city recycling program. Alderman Thank you, Mayor.
you need to use the podium so that you can be heard. I'm not going to use it to look, look for a job. I'm look well, for a job. I'm okay, we don't have, okay, well, uh, you're not going to be able to be heard on the Facebook Live. All right, maybe I can just. Can you put it on this side of the ground? I can do that. Yeah, stand at the, and I'll try to, I'll try to. Sit down. And I'll try to address the board. Can I be heard now? You, uh, well, on, on the TV. This was okay. Facebook. It wasn't because sure. you couldn't be heard in the room. This was in order to Facebook. So since the board has is, is heard this, it's, um, we're, we're less of a concern than, than the audience. Um, okay. Let's look at the first slide past this but second slide, excuse me. Um, let's look and see what Oxford does. And, and I'll, I'll start this by and qualify this by saying most of these other cities, if not all of them, are using uh, or have access to a recycling sorting facility where they take their recycling. And it's it's a pretty sophisticated uh, operation where they where it's sorted. And it's a combination of mechanical equipment and people working there. We don't have that luxury here. We have a, there is a drop-off site or a collection site in Columbus that Waste Pro um, affords for us and for, for MSU, but it doesn't have the sophistication, sophistication that some of these other places have. But within that, let's, let's talk about some of these other cities. Oxford, Mississippi, let's talk about what they do. Um, they have municipal two-day-per-week garbage pickup, one-day-per-week curbside recycling, which includes number one and two plastics, um, they dual stream their plastics and aluminum, aluminum and steel cans, which means they, they co-mingle those, they put those together. Their fee per month is $22 per month, which includes their recycling. Um, they have ordered and will start using uh, these large 96-gallon tipper bins for garbage pickup, which will be owned by the city and issued to residential customers at no cost. Um, the recycling is put out beside the um, beside the garbage um, in, in individual smaller bins. Um, Oxford has three drop-off sites in addition to their curbside recycling. And the lady who's the um, environmental services person at Oxford told me that 40% of Oxford's 14,000 residents has utilized curbside recycling. So it's, it's very popular up there. And that's after they discontinued it w during COVID for two years and reinstated it this past year. So they, they, they're back up and running. Let's look at the next slide. Um, City of Fayetteville, Arkansas. They have, when I say municipal garbage pickup, that means the city owns the garbage trucks and run, does this through, the, uh, through like we do, through a municipally owned uh, sanitation department. They haven't they have contracted that. So they have municipal one day per, per week garbage pickup. Uh, the city issues tipper bins for garbage and recycling containers to res residential customers. Uh, City of Fayetteville has three different size garbage tippers and charges a different monthly price based on the size. So that's the encouragement they have up there for people to, to, to recycle. If you buy, a, if you if you pay for a smaller bin for your garbage, you're gonna have to figure out a way to put more of that in the recycle stream. Um, so it's an inducement to do that. Um, their recycling include, includes plastics and glass, and they have two recycling drop-off sites in addition to their, their curbside. Um, next slide. Let's look at Auburn. Auburn has, like us, municipal, a municipal uh, sanitation department, one day per week garbage pickup. Um, they do one day per week curbside recycling. They do it on the same day. If you look at this uh, vehicle they have, that's one of those tipper trucks that drives by. It's, it's got two compartments. Uh, that one has a driver. Uh, there are no people that ride on the back of the truck. The driver drives up and, and uh, dumps the recycling, and then he drives up a little further and picks up the, the um, garbage and dumps both of them in two different compartments. And uh, that's the way Auburn does theirs. One day per week, curbside recycling. See, the city issues these, these bins for both the garbage and recycling. Um, Auburn has a recycling drop-off site at their sanitation department like we do. Um, they single stream their recycling, meaning everything goes into that one recycling container. 
and they also includes uh, number one through number seven plastics. Um, at their recycling drop-off site, they will accept glass bottles and jars uh, at that drop-off site. All right, next. Tuscaloosa. They also have a municipal uh, run residential one day per week garbage uh, service with curbside recycling on the same day. They do doing some at Auburn. They're gonna they pick it up at the same time. Tipper bins for garbage and recycling are issued by the city. Um, recycling includes plastics and glass, and they have 15 recycling drop-off sites in the city. So they have a lot of them. All right, next slide, please. Let's look at uh, Athens, Georgia. Athens, Georgia, and Clark County, which is the county they're located in, and have one central. They have a combined government like Nashville and Davidson County. Ash, uh, um, Athens and Clark County, Georgia are all one uh, government. They have, in relation to their city, though, municipal one day uh, per week garbage pickup and single stream, meaning they put all their, their recycling into one, one container. Curbside recycling, and they do their garbage and their, their recycling on the same day. Uh, they have th three different size garbage tippers, uh, those different garbage containers, and different prices for each. They're, again, to en encourage people to, to recycle. Um, they uh, issue recycling tipper bins to residential customers at no charge. The city can, probably continues to own those things, but issues them to, to uh, residential customers. Uh, they recycle most plastics and glass bottles and jars. And they probably, I think they do that at curbside, put your glass jars in, in these containers. Uh, they have nine recycling drop-off sites in the city. Uh, slash county, and uh, and so that's and there's a, a picture of their of their uh, garbage slash recycling trucks, uh, tipper trucks. Next slide, please. Gainesville, Florida. Florida Gators. Municipal uh, municipally run sanitation department. One day per week garbage and recycling pickup on the same day. They have uh, again three different sizes of gar these garbage bins with different prices for each. Recycling containers are issued to residential customers at no cost, and recycle, they recycle most plastics and also glass bottles and jars. And they, the city of Gainesville has no drop-off sites. Okay. And next slide. Thank you. Um, this is Columbia, Missouri, city of Columbia, Missouri, which is the host for uh, University of Missouri, host community. They have, this is the community that's most like what we do right now. They have one day per week residential garbage pickup by private contractor. That's, that's different from us. They, they've, they've contracted out like Columbus and like a lot of cities in Mississippi. They've, they've, they pick up, their garbage is picked up and recycled with a commercial hauler, commercial contractor. Um, curbside residential recycling is collected twice a month on the same day as garbage. The city furnishes bags like we do for both garbage and uh, like we used to do uh, for recycling, similar to start with previous garbage slash recycling program. Uh, Columbia, Missouri has nine drop-off sites, and uh, their recycling includes uh, number one through number seven plastics and glass bottles and jars. The uh, city of Columbia is like here. They issue vouchers. If you're a resident of the city of Columbia, you, you can redeem those vouchers for garbage bags and for recycling bags. Um, any questions about any of this so far? All right, let's look at let's look at the next slide. Here's a proposal, and I, I have consulted with uh, numbers of people and looked at these other communities, and I've talked with, with uh, sanitation and, and environmental directors in other cities, and uh, tried to come up with something that will work for the city of Start within the context of what we have to operate with, with Waste, Waste Pro and, and with, the, with their site and, and, and uh, within that framework. What is, we're proposing tonight is a, an opt-in program um, where a person or a residential customer would con contact the sanitation department to be included in this. Uh, number two, the second bullet would be the curbside pickup would be two times per month likely probably the first and third Wednesdays because Wednesday's not a, not a garbage day. Um, it would include current recyclables plus, and I've talked with, with the, the Waste Pro people, and if we kept it separated and clean, 
Um, we could we could add one number one or two plastics. I know that's that's uh, um, something that's encouraging because I know we've always want, wanted to kind of get the one or two plastic uh, recycling back. Um, we'll um, be issue, the city would issue two 18 gallon recycling buckets for plastics and can and cans and slash paper. We have been through a grant last year. We we per purchased 500. I know of these small green. Uh, buckets that are, have recycling on the side of them, that kind of thing. Um, so they're available. Um, cardboard would be flattened at the you know, and stacked under these two buckets. You'd have a bucket for um, you'd have a bucket for plastics. You have a bucket for cans, um, for paper slash cans, uh, 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 metal and aluminum and steel cans. Then you you flatten the cardboard and put that under these two buckets. So we would issue two buckets to each uh, household that opts into this. Um, we have some, uh, and it's an optional, 64-gallon roll container available. I'll show you some pictures of these in just a minute um, that, that would, could be, would be available upon request. Now, these are, these are containers that the city would own and just issue to the homeowner. Um, this could be used to, for the flattened cardboard, and it has a lid on it. And if you had a tipper truck, these things would tip, but they're, they're the size that, are, that could be handled by people who are um, who are picking up the, the recycling. Um, what we're proposing is $6 per month to be added to the sanitation fee for curbside, for curbside recycling customers. So, um, and I've got an asterisk down that said that plastic recycling, right now, we probably won't be able to do plastic recycling at the, at the drop-off site. This would be strict, and then I think this would be an incentive for people to sign up for, for curbside recycling to be able to, to recycle one or two plastics. Um, Mr. Smiley, you in the room? Anything that you want to add or anything that I've not said correctly on this? Um, on the baby, this is the proposal you're wanting the board to vote on? Yes, ma'am. Okay. Um, any, any questions from the board? Right. Yeah, well, thanks. Thanks for the, the work. You, you put a lot, a lot of work into it, and thank you all for coming. And uh, I will sign up for this, uh, but I won't vote for it until we get some numbers on what it's, it's going to cost. I wouldn't vote on anything without knowing what the numbers are. And I think there needs, to, for me, I can't speak for anyone else, if it costs X, and that means we need X hundred folks signed up, I am willing to knock that threshold down to enough people that maybe make up 50% of the cost, right? But we need to know what those numbers I've are. Would you like to come back up and join us on the, on the podium? That'd be great. I mean, on the di um, bench, whatever this thing is up here. So my, my question, I guess, uh, if we have 300 folks signed up, or 92% said they'd be willing, of that 300 said they'd be willing to pay for it, add my name to the list, so maybe 92.1%, uh, that still is less than $1,800 a month. So what is the number for the city, and then what is a reasonable threshold of people to sign up to say, let's go with this? Mr. Smiley, can you come up to the podium to the lectern and, and help me with this? What we plan to do, Alderman Rupp, is um, put the containers that we, for, for the collection of, of the curbside recycling, Mr. Smiley, I'll get you to elaborate on this, behind the sanitation department in a place that we've d determined that we can do this. Um, we have, are, are, have determined, we think, that, that we would have three to four, would have four different individual containers, one for, for steel and aluminum cans, one for paper, one cardboard, one plastic. Uh, Waste Pro has told us they would, how much would they charge per pull? Uh, 300 per pull. 300 per pull. Per pull, uh, per from pull of each item? I mean, each, each, each container each when it's, when it's, yes ma'am, when it's full. And uh, we think that we would fill up one of these containers, each one of these containers at, the, at most, once per month, correct? On the curbside? Each of them. Now, what you're going to do is, is reduce the number of pull when when people start curbside recycling, it's going to reduce the number of people coming out to the, the drop-off site. 
but we, we're estimating. We don't know, and, and if you're asking for hard numbers, we won't know until we get in the recycling business and we know how many customers we pick up. But we estimate that, we, you know, that the, the cost of, for us to, to have these, these bins uh, picked up by Waste Pro and taken back to Columbus would be somewhere in the $1,200 or so per month uh, range which our $6, if we had 300 customers, we have 250 customers, would cover the cost of that. That's $1,500 a month. 250, 250 customers times what? Uh, six, that's $1,500 per month. Does that include the cost for us to pick up at the curbs? Um, I'll let uh, Mr. Smite elaborate on that. Our, our, our thoughts were that instead of using a garbage truck um, and the the manpower that would be required on that and wear and tear on a $300,000 uh, um, garbage truck that we would use to pick up and pull our, what do you call it, thing, alley cat yes, that has compartments behind it where we can separate. That, that makes it easier for us because uh, there's, there are five different separation bins, separated bins on the alley cat, um, which is this long trailer that you see that's got the stainless steel on it and different compartments and things, which would allow us to, to, to do that. Um, and I've estimated, I don't know what you, you probably were looking at, but I've estimated that we would do four to five probably, uh, we would probably different times to have to go back and unload and come back at curbside if we had somewhere between 250 and 300 customers. This program is not designed, and the way we've set it up with this six, with a $6 fee and the way we want to do it, to handle 1,000 customers. It probably just won't handle it. But Mr. Smiley, tell me what you think on that. If we, if we get to 800,000 customers, we're going to have to have some, some equipment beyond this, right? Yes, sir, that's correct. Um, so but this, this gets us back in the curbside recycling business. It allows us to cover the cost of the, of the hauls from, from Starkville back to Waste Pro in um, Columbus. It also, by doing, the, doing it the way we would do it, we would conform with the, the way they would need things separated um, because they, don't, they separate stuff by hand over there. And, uh, and costs go up, and so, but this would be a way for us to, to recycle and separate here, and when they picked it up and, and carried it back to Columbus, it's separated and ready for them to go into certain parts of that, that collection site over there and bail it, you know, bail it and look for their markets and that kind of thing. Well, the, the part of me that is a, a resident of Starkville is ready to sign up. The part of me that has responsibility as an alderman to look over uh, the city's financials, I would, I would want something from our budget chair saying, Here's the labor, here's the fuel, here's what it's going to cost. And I, I still want to support, but I, I would, I, I think, from the, to be responsible in my older position, I'm going to have to see the numbers. Okay, let me, <clears throat> let me ask a question here. Is that alley cat designed for, for trolling the streets? It can patrol the street, but it's not designed for that. Well, I can patrol the streets, but I'm not designed for that either. So it, it, would, it, would it make its way, how long would it survive? Any? Yes, because it's quite old now. We've had it for, what, 10 years? Yes. So tires, pull? You will have to factor in wear and tear because you will be using it more than we're currently using it right now. Right. It's going Monday, Wednesdays, and Fridays? Or and and that's basically just being and popped and off to the fire station. Right. Okay. Um, and uh, so we would have to pull them out of Alicat and put them in. So you're talking manpower. Yes. So a day to, a day to do that and then also transfer from the Alicat over to the to the bins provided by Waste Pro? Yes, this is all basically startup. This is only getting you started. This is not a sustainable option. This is just a startup. Okay. All right. Um, I'm sorry, Alden Brooks, were you done? All right, Alden Brooks. Well, the second one, all the rough set, and all the way on the community, you obviously have a lot of time to give it. It is certainly, uh, it's been a labor of love for you, it's certainly something that you're passionate about. And, uh, uh, and we've got a lot of uh, people here to support it, so, you know, if we can make this thing work, that's great. But I'm, I'm like all the rough, um, concerned somewhat about the cost. And, and as one of the young ladies said when we, when we started, it was about the feasibility of it. And as, uh, in, my, in my other job, I, I do a lot of feasibility studies as an appraiser. So and that, that's my concern: cost versus revenue. You know, and I was looking at uh, I was looking at your numbers from Oxford, and they got 40 percent, uh, 40 percent of 14,000 households 
have signed up. So that's about 5,600. And yet the 14,000, and you know, just come, kind of compared to what we've got, uh, you know, we're paying about $16 or so, and they're paying six, $22. So $6 times 14,000. You know, that's giving them about 80 something thousand dollars, $84,000 a month or so in revenue, which, you know, you divide that out by the 5,600, and that's about $15. You know that I'm 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 really concerned. You know that, that the six is going to cover things. Um, we've got uh, cost of fuel, wear down the trucks, and, and correct me. We're, we're not going to be sorting. We're not going to be taking out of the bags. We, we're just actually going to take the bags and put them in the. bins and send them off. We there actually won't be any bags. Well, that, oh, well, West, sorry, yeah. West Pro doesn't want bags, so we're not. We're not going to do that. Um, You'll just be, we'll just, we'll just go straight into that. Look, I'll, I'll be honest with you. I mean, the, six of those seven towns up there have uh, one day per week garbage pickup. And that's that's the norm, not the exception. We're doing two days per week garbage pickup. We could go to one day per week garbage pickup, take the other day, day and commit it to, to curbside recycling. We'd have all, we, money would be in the wild. Um, what we're trying to do is start a program, a bare bones program, because people want curbside recycling. And apparently, I, I mean, I don't know, but I, I sense that, I mean, I, I want to make it work financially. And I mean, I, I have a business, and I know, I know about making business, you know, financial decisions that make businesses break, you know, cash flow, that kind of thing. And we want, our, we want this, this thing to not suck up money from sanitation some, or something like that. At the same time, um, I would want my colleagues up here to try to work with me, and I haven't had, maybe I hadn't asked for it, but here before, and the mayor, to work with me to try to find a way to make this thing work, rather than looking for ways for it not to work. And that's what I sense. I sense that we're looking for every way in the world not to do this. And there's seven other college towns that they're, they're further ahead than we are. We know that all the time. I harp on that all the time. That we, I think we live in a vacuum here. Of course, the word insular, Mississippi is insular. And that includes us. You know, we don't know what's going on in Georgia and Alabama and Tennessee and Arkansas and these other places. And what we don't know puts us behind, you know, we, we get behind. And so, I mean, I would be for anybody, I would, take, would entertain suggestions on that about one day per week garbage. Uh, my, my children, my daughter and son-in-law, they said we go to one day garbage pickup just like that. Alderman, this, uh, Alderman Brooks had the floor. So but, I mean, he did ask me a question. He did, and, and but I'm, he didn't go through me to do it, and in this case, he had the floor. So you've had an opportunity to, to say a good bit. Well, so let's go, down, let's go down the line. Well, let, let me finish mm -hmm. saying what I was going to say about that. Finish it, please. Oh. Because that's off topic. You're on curbside recycling, I don't, not I don't one think, day a week. I don't think anything that I've been discussed here has been off topic with curbside recycling. Go ahead. Finish up. Um, but I, I, I do think that, that what we're trying to do is, is – incorporate a bare bones, minimal curbside program into a town that's got two day, a, a sacrosanct two day a, a week garbage pickup and um, without spending a lot of money, you know, a, a, a huge amount of money, which we don't have and we're not, I don't think that there's appetite in our community to put on an additional four or five, five, five dollar fee mandatory on everybody in the city, in the city of Starkville. So this is an, an opt-in program that we felt like we could pay the cost on to pull that, take that stuff and haul it back to Columbus, that we could find a way to, to, to pick it up without having to buy a $300,000 garbage truck, and um, that's what we were trying to do. Okay, thank you. Anything further, further Alderman Brooks? Uh, Mayor, I, I apologize. That's okay. Anything further? Well, the only thing I would add to that, uh, Alderman Mayor, is, uh, yeah, I, if, if we can make it work, I'm, I'm all for it because it's been about out there that are concerned about it and interested in it. Uh, but the only thing that I would, one of my concerns would be if we, we started, we stopped it, we started, we stopped it, and, and if we, we're not, you know, if it's not sustainable uh, from cost wise when we start, then, you know, it'll be one of the first things that we, we want to cut because it's costing us too much money and then we're right back here again. That, that's my only concern. I think all of them are up too is, you know, let's just make sure we got that. The, the numbers work out, and the numbers work out, then we're, we're good. And they don't have to be, you know, I mean, 
I think the last time that we just. Alderman Beatty, you don't have a floor, please. Alderman Rose. Right. All right, thank you. Alderman Sistrom. Um, I, I'd like to say that I, I don't think there's anybody sitting up here who is unwilling to look at a curbside recycling program. I do think that our responsibility is to either make a decision about whether it's the kind of program where everybody in the city is charged for it, and, and I don't think that there's an appetite for that, so I don't think that's going to happen. Or if we'll have an opt-in program and the opt-in fee is sufficient to cover the cost of the recycling. Um, I, I peeked back at what we took in in revenues in tw fiscal year 20, which was the last year that we had a, a, a recycling program, um, and we took in a little over $25,000. That's a little over $2,000 a month. That's slightly more than we would be um, talking about with 300 people at $6 a month, um, which is going to come in at about $20,000 a year, I think. Um, that year, our hauling fees alone, just the hauling fees to get the recycling from Starkville to the next step was um, $42,000. So the other, the, the non-curbside recyclers were having to subsidize because our, our rates were too low. And that's just the hauling fees. There are other costs that are affiliated with it. We, we have labor, um, gasoline, trucks, replacing an alley cat, whatever, um, that we need to come up with a number. I, I'll be honest, um, I think that the number will probably have to be closer to 15 or $20 a month. And, and if there's a market out there for people who want to pay that much for curbside recycling, and if we can work through it, then I, I think we would all be supportive of it. But I don't think there is an appetite for implementing a program that doesn't cover its cost and has to be subsidized by um, the remaining customers in, in the city. And I do think Alderman uh, Brooks is, is absolutely correct. The absolute worst thing we can do is start this, do it for a couple of months, and then take it away again. So we, if, if we do it, we want to do it right, and we want to price it right. If it's going to be an opt-in program, we want to price it right, and we, we don't have enough information this evening to make that particular decision. I have offered in the past to, to help try to, to work through some numbers like that. I, I will throw out one more time what I think is the, the solution. I think we should do a, a request for a proposal from Waste Pro, Waste Management, anybody else in, in the world who's in the recycling business, um, for them to offer a curbside program here in, this, in the city. That takes any emotion out of it from the board. They, they will price it accordingly. And much like Recyclops, when they were here in town, they, they will make a business decision and, um, and, and will operate a program like a business. I'd, I'd also like to say, as y'all were coming up and speaking this evening, um, I, I've heard two or three of you who apparently live on the east side of campus, look at me with my directions, on the east side of campus, um, you're not in the city limits. And so we wouldn't be able to provide this service to you. So um, just, just, just FYI. May I, may I respond no, to that? I mean, no, this has been my problem. This is nothing to respond to. She's yes, making a statement. I, but I mean, I need to respond. I'm going to go down the line I and I will come back to you. Make your notes and I will come back to you. Vice Mayor Perkins. Very briefly, um, I concur with the comments from the uh, distinguished budget chair. We as a municipality have a lot of financial obligations. Uh, we have an unfunded mandate that we'll be looking at in August from the state of Mississippi. And with all candidness, straightforwardness, and plowing straight down the road, I cannot vote for it. We don't have the funds. This is not a priority in my opinion. And this is something that um, has a big cost to it. And I just don't see it as being a very high priority for our city at this time, given the things that we're going to have to deal with and vote with. And, um, and Mayor, this unfunded mandate is going to be a, a major discussion at this table that we've been presented with. And I just don't see uh, our taking on this matter 
uh, given the financial magnitude. We just don't have any available funds as the budget chair indicated. And I'm going to yield to her expertise. If I had to vote on this tonight, my vote would be no. I yield there. Thank you. When you say hop in, when you, when you've got to know how many customers that you want to have. We can't, you can't hop in with 25, 30, 80 customers like, like, like Jeffrey said, Auburn Flying War II said. We got to, War three. we got to know how many we're going to hop in for you can try to put a dollar figure with it. You've got to put a dollar figure with it. So how many are you going to hop in? So you, you can't just hop in with 20 people, 30 people, 40, 50 people. That number would never, it would never, eat, it would never equate to what? what we they probably need. We don't know the cost. They're not giving us a real cost. Thank you. All right, Alderman Baker, your turn again. Um, did, um, Ms. Van Imps, didn't y'all do a survey of people that would likely sign up for this program? Yes. We did, yes, sir. In addition to 200 you're gonna, If you will come forward, we need to be able to hear you. Yes, sir, that is correct. That is also in addition to 200 previous signatures from past fall um, collected at the community market that was also in support of bringing back curbside recycling. Now, at that time, we did not have numbers like $6 a month to offer people because it was so early on in the process. We were gauging information about who would be interested in paying a nominal fee for having curbside recycling services returned. So that is in addition to the over 300 participants that we had in our data collection. Just a question about that. Okay. If you, uh, Alderman, well, let me let me be. Alderman Beatty, are you? I mean, we haven't discussed about this, Mayor. I mean, I know it's protocol stuff like that. I'm, I'm fine with Jeffrey asking questions. We need well, to ask those questions. When we survey folks and ask right. if they supported, be willing to pay, did we qualify? Did they live in an apartment? Did they live in the city? I did we know if these college students where they lived? Yes, sir. We collected um, addresses in addition to that survey um, with the understanding that with my conversations with Ms. Alderman Beatty and um, Mr. Smiley and working at sanitation, that these kind of services would be available to people living in apartment complexes um, off a, um, based off of communications with uh, the owners and managers of such apartment complexes. So you and know the folks who signed this all live in the city. All those addresses have been checked. Yes, sir. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Thank you Ms. Very much. Um, I mean, I, I'm I'm not surprised to push back on this, and this 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 financial this financial obligations involved with this. We spend a lot of money on a lot of stuff, and I won't get into the details of that tonight. But we spend all on stuff, and the stuff that we're that we're excited, enthusiastic about, we spend a lot of money on. And I'll say this. The program was discontinued, from what I understand, and uh, the, the forty-two thousand dollars that the, the vice, that the uh, financial chairman, uh, Alderman Sistrunt, was talking about, is because we had a contract with waste management who was hauling our our uh, recycling to Tupelo, Mississippi, not to Columbus, Mississippi. And I don't know why anybody on, on the board of previous previous administration didn't try to negotiate with Waste Pro at that time, but they didn't. And so, uh, and also, we had open top bins out at our at our sanitation department where people were probably throwing garbage. And it was probably contaminated, and probably, likely, some of it went to Tupelo and it went to a landfill because it was so contaminated. So we weren't controlling. We weren't controlling uh, re our recycling when it came to us, and we weren't. We didn't have a clue about somebody else, maybe in Columbus, 25 miles away, that might so that that would have reduced that $42,000 cost significantly. What nobody was looking for it because I think what they were looking to do was discontinue recycling. And um, so um, what we're trying to do right now is come up with a way for people to be able to recycle and do it. And, and, and I know all of sister, I mean, I haven't, I know people have known because I've been talking about it for two or three months now at meetings and saying I was going to bring this up. I haven't had one person on this board come to me, other than so all sister had one time. A couple and say I'll help you with some numbers. I hadn't had any encouragement or anybody else uh, say anything to me about about helping or being or being positive about it, or recycling curbside recycling or anything. Not one, not one, not one word. And they've all known I was trying to do it. So they'll tell you the sentiment of the board up here on that. And um, all I got to say is we we got kind of one leg in the hole because we don't have a, a regional facility like Oxford and Lafayette County. 
the, the uh, sorting facility are like Tuscaloosa has, or like all uh, Auburn. I don't know what the county is over there that they're in, but those those places have those. But we have an opportunity to get in the curbside recycling business. I don't think it'll take 15 to 20 dollars to do that. Um, yes, if, if we cost out every, you know, the depreciation on on a five, ten-year-old pickup truck that's caught that's pulling the attic cat or something like that. Yeah, we probably, you know, there's, there's probably some cost involved with uh, the expense of, of taking a truck and pulling a trailer around town to do this. But I guess I go back to this, this point right here, and this includes the mayor. We're looking for a way not to do this. The city, it just, it, it, it's, it, it's very obvious that we're looking for a way not to do this. Instead of looking for a way to get in here and roll our sleeves up, and find a way to make this make curbside recycling work. There's a way to make it work, and I and I and, and I would be willing to concede all kind of stuff that I that 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 we've worked on and studied and looked at and and and, and labored over. Uh, if my colleagues would get in here and roll their sleeves up and and work with me on this, I, I'm delaying. You know, hell, it's been delayed for for two years now, and and you know, it's sitting on, on it's it's kind of sitting on life support now. And we do have. Look, I'll tell you this too. Um, our recycling drop-off site is the, the recycling out there is clean. It's very clean. I mean, it's 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 as uh, Mr. Smiley can tell you that Waste Pro tells us all the time that we really manage that well. We probably would manage a, an opt-in uh, curbside recycling program very well, also. And I suspect that the recycling would be sorted and clean there, also. I just suspect people that that, that opt into something and pay six or seven dollars, whatever it would take, that kind of thing, are going to be people who are serious about recycling. But I guess what I'm saying is, and this is the public out there, I, I would encourage you, if you're interested in us having curbside recycling, please put some pressure on us, because there is no appetite up here right now to do curbside recycling. I'm the only person to put, and, and, and people that are out here, and citizens and people, the students for Sustainable Campus who have, have, are very, very, I'm just very impressed with the work you all doing, the research you've done, and, 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 and what you mean. And, and I tell you what, these young people see things that, that are going on in our environment and things that we're going to, they're going to be facing that. I mean, I'm 60, I'm almost 68 years old. I won't be around a lot longer. Y'all going to be around a long time. And all these storms and all this flooding and all this stuff like that that climate scientists tell us are, is, are, you know, is, is, is carbon emissions and, and us polluting our atmosphere and polluting our water and our, our, our you know, our, our soil and places like that and things like that. It's happening. You're going, you're going to inherit that stuff from us. I'm sorry, but but you all, but that's just we we've kind of fiddled around with it, and y'all are going to have to pick up, you know, pick up the pieces and and, and deal with it. Um, but I won't start with if, if Oxford, Mississippi can recycle, and Tuscaloosa, Alabama can recycle, we can recycle, and we can find a way to do it. And what I challenge my colleagues to do is get, let's get let's put it on the agenda next meeting, and let's get and roll our sleeves up. And try to figure out to make at a, at a work meeting something to make this thing work instead of looking for every excuse in the world not to do it. And that's all I that's all I'm get, getting right now. And if you think there's anything anything and anybody that rebuts me on this is, is, is telling you is, is not telling you straight. Nobody up here wants to do this but me. Well, and and I, you, you've made your point, I believe. I, and I'm not through talking. Well, but and I'm, I'm an elected. I'm I'm, a, a I'm not going to make the motion tonight because I know how it's going to go down. But I'll tell you, tell you this. Um, we need to get our heads together and try to figure out how we can make this thing work. And I don't care who who leads or who gets the credit for it. I have n that has no interest in that. What I want to see want to see is curbside recycling. And I will tell you this: um, Alderman Sistrunk said something about putting this thing out for bid. Waste Pro's not going to bid the recycling, uh, just recycling. And if they can get our garbage business. You know, they take that recycling business. That's the only reason they recycle over Mississippi State's because they have Mississippi State's garbage business. They make money in the garbage. I've, they've told me that. They take Mississippi State's recycling and put up with it. And it's contaminated. They put up with it as an accommodation because they're making money in the garbage business. They're no, we're not in a position with in-house recycling like we do with our own trucks and, and stuff to be able to go out and have anything that's attractive to offer a contract company. And then there's nobody close to that's got a sorting facility, a waste pros in Columbus, and they've got that drop-off site. And so that's what we're dealing with. And that's the reason we had to kind of work around all these different um, 
you know, obstacles to try to come up with a program. But I, I would challenge my co colleagues, let's, let's, let's roll our sleeves up and let's in good faith, earnestly, try to come up with a, a curbside recycling program, given the information that you've had from me and from these people and the stuff that, that you know that we've got to deal with. But uh, let's, let's don't look for a way for this not to work. I yield. All right. Thank you. If there is no, no motion, no further discussion on this matter, we need, we need to move on to the claims docket. Do I have a motion for the claims docket? So, I have a motion from Alderman Ruff. Do I have a second? Right. Second, from everybody stand. second from Alderman Brooks. All those in favor? Any further discussion? All those in favor? Please signify by saying aye. Aye. Opposed? Aye. Nay. All right. Motion carries. And that takes us to the end, I believe, yes, to the end of our docket. Um, I have one item to read, and then I'll take a motion for us to adjourn. Uh, there will be a work session with the Mayor and Board of Alderman Friday, February the 3rd, 2023, at 11 a.m., start with City Hall, located at 110 West Main Street, the second floor conference room. The public and media are invited to attend. It will be posted within the hour of our um, making this the announcement. So do I have a motion to adjourn? Mm -hmm. I have a motion from Alderman Rupp to adjourn. Do I have a second? Second. Second from Alderman Vaughn. All those in favor, please signify by saying aye. Aye. Opposed? All right, we are in adjournment. Thank you, everyone.